Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Garrett Womble, and thank you for joining. Uh, today's presentation and discussion by Praxis 3 principals Brian Tanner and Stuart Rahm will be on the intersection of the physical and digital worlds and is the first of our six-part webinar series on the future of research libraries. We appreciate the opportunity to answer any questions you may have following today's discussion. Those questions can be submitted throughout the presentation by using the dialog box on the right-hand side of your screen. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brian Tanner to get us started. Thanks, Garrett. Uh, today's presentation is called Get Fidgetal, uh, Environments That Intersect the Physical and Digital Worlds. And it's the story of how the Georgia Tech Library has embraced both physical and digital media to chart its path forward as a research library at one of the world's leading engineering universities. Uh, we're gonna have a little introduction to the project and the project team. We're gonna talk about the history that led up to, to Georgia Tech Library, the Georgia Tech Library's renewal project. We're gonna talk about the visioning process, which is what the library undertook to inform the vision that would inform the design process. We're gonna talk about the programming, which is uh, related to the operational and aspirational media concept. We'll talk a lot about that today. That's really how the design team developed a program based on uh, the visioning. And then we'll do questions at the end. Uh, credit, where credit is due. Uh, there have literally been a cast of hundreds on this project. So many people involved uh, to, do a, to do a project like this over more than seven years. Um, uh, we've already said Georgia Tech is the sort of case study that we're looking at today. They were obviously a major collaborator on the project. The owner was the Georgia Board of Regents and GSFIC. This was a state project. The architecture and media team uh, led by BNIM out of Kansas City and Praxis 3 based in Atlanta. Uh, we collaborated throughout the entire process and all of the imagery you're going to see today was collectively produced by the BNIM Praxis 3 team. Uh, interactive media design, so the software and interactive uh, experience uh, design was done at the collaborative stage by a small design firm out of Boston and Second Story based here in Atlanta. And again, many of the images you'll see for that part of the presentation were developed by Small Design and Second Story in collaboration with Praxis 3 and BNIM. And then the visioning process was led by Bright Spot, Bright Spot Strategies, who were uh, engaged directly by the library in Georgia Tech to create a vision for the project. Uh, this is an update on a presentation that we gave a little while ago at a SCUP conference and features myself and Stuart Rom, who you have here with you today. Uh, we're missing, though, Charlie Bennett from the Georgia Tech Library, who helped us to prepare a lot of the materials you'll see today and uh, was on our original presentation, a real, a real important collaborator with us on this project. Learning outcomes, we're gonna talk about how digital native users' needs are changing, and that's across the world and also on your particular campuses. We're gonna talk about methods for encouraging stakeholders to collaborate on new models, integrating physical and digital environments. We're gonna see examples of how digitally interactive spaces can be used when a library shifts its focus away from physical artifacts toward digital artifacts. And we're gonna look at ways that digital data visualization can be used to enhance wayfinding and creation of landmarks to engage students with their campus environment. So let's talk about the history. Georgia Tech Library's journey to a digital future. So uh, there you see in the image on the left, that's the Georgia Tech Library. The building on the left-hand side is the Price Gilbert Memorial Building. It was built in 1953. Uh, the building on the right is Crosland Tower, built in 1968, and collectively they are the Georgia Tech library. And in the 50 or 60 years since those uh, buildings were built, a lot has changed in terms of, of how libraries do their work. In the image on the right, you see our friend Charlie, uh, a librarian uh, at Georgia Tech, and Amit Doshi, another Georgia Tech librarian, who do lots of things as librarians. This is their radio program that they do weekly at WREK. They also do a podcast where they talk about library-related issues and also play a lot of really interesting music. So if you like rock and roll and you like uh, libraries, uh, check out their podcast. It's called Lost in the Stacks and it's awesome. Stuart's been on it, he was great. Um, throughout the 90s, Georgia Tech, Georgia Tech Library had tracked some trends that were discouraging to them. Uh, gate count was down, book checkouts were down, uh, their stature on campus was down. So at, the begin so at the turn of the millennium, they embarked on a few projects 
and we're going to look at some of those projects. And the effect that they had over time was to reverse the trend of the gate count going down. So between 2004 and 2013, they were able to increase their relevance on campus and increase the gate count, the number of people that used the library. But the book checkout trend continued to drop. So in 2002, the first project they did was, was to create an information commons on the ground level of the Price Gilbert building. And it consisted of 100 computer stations. They moved the, the reference desk to this location. They added tech support to the list of services that librarians provide in the library. And uh, really, it, it, the, it, the effect that it had was to raise the library's impact on campus. It did increase the gate count, but had no effect on the decreasing uh, collection. You see the image on the left in 1953, a more a traditional reading room on the right, the information commons. This led them to the conclusion that the library was ready to really talk about the library as a place for digital uh, intervention. The next project they did in 2006 was in the East Commons and was an academic social space. Uh, this was in the Cross and Tower building to the east. And it consisted of a coffee shop, lounge furniture, collaborative computing, multimedia services. It was uh, supported by the circulation desk. And uh, it was really called by some an academic student center. So uh, it, was a it was intended to be a home away from home, a destination for students. Uh, it really uh, reflected students' digital work habits, their 24-hour schedule, and the fact uh, that uh, their, computer, their education was increasingly computer reliant. At this point, there are no more books on the first floor of the Georgia Tech Library. It's all of these sort of interactive social and digital uh, information environments. In 2009, they moved up to the second floor and did another intervention, which was uh, called a study commons. Uh, you'll notice there are no fixed computers in this view. This is a completely mobile environment, so it assumes that all the users will have their own equipment, and so we will have lots of ways to plug in devices and appliances and, and various other things. It's loud, it's rowdy, it's a whole different kind of space, it's a very social space, and it's very popular with the, with, and had been very popular with the students. Then in 2011, Georgia Tech opened the Clough Undergraduate Learning Commons. And these, these are both images of Clough Commons. Um, in the picture on the left, if you look up in the right-hand corner, you'll see a brick building with a flat roof. That's the Georgia Tech Library. So Clough is literally connected to the library. And Clough really delivers on, uh, in a very meaningful way, a lot of the research that had been going on inside the library in terms of these digitally interactive spaces. So the library found themselves in 2011 connected to this gleaming uh, new form of, of, of learning commons, uh, and, and their own library looked like this. And Charlie used to joke that this was these were really flattering pictures. It was actually uh, not even as nice as this. So in comparison, the library did look a bit shabby and embarked on the process of renovation and renewal. So to renovate a 230,000 square foot library complex means doing something with all the books while you do all of the construction. During the process of thinking about that, somebody asked a very important question. What if the books don't come back? What if instead of coming back, we create a place that's optimized for the books so that we can implement a lot of the ideas we have about libraries in this facility without having to increase the footprint? And that's exactly what they did. They formed a collaboration with Emory University. They collectively built a, a, a building on the Briar, on Emory's Briarcliff campus that will house the books in a protected environment that will increase the lifespan of the current collection. And students and faculty can order uh, or check out books online, have them delivered to their dorm rooms or faculty offices or to the library within 24 hours for pickup. It seemed like a win-win situation for everybody. And it really freed up the library to think about things in a very different way as they look to renew their own uh, establishment. So they set out trying to develop a vision for that project a process called visioning. Uh, uh, they engaged with Bright Spot Strategies to develop what they called a playbook, which is sort of like a, a playbook in the sense of a football team's book of plays. These are, act, these are actions which are intended to have certain outcomes. 
uh, they really looked to look at how things were happening across the entire Georgia Tech community, not just in the library, and really wanted to break the habit of doing the things that they the same way that they'd always done it. Uh, they did campus-wide user research. They really wanted to engage with the entire arc of the process of research, not simply the checking out of books and other uh, reference materials, but think about also how something is produced, how it's documented, and how it's delivered back out to the world at large. So they built a playbook that identified all of these things I was just talking about. One of the emphasis that they that they gave uh, to the to the playbook was the support of both physical and digital activities within that arc of research. So the playbook identified eight core actions or plays, and these were kind of understood as things to do or activities to happen, not really a program of spaces that would come later. So virtual browsing has to do with using computers to look at the collection, both uh, physical and digital. Uh, innovation and ideation studio is a sort of a makerspace light type of space where innovation and ideation across disciplines could happen. The teaching studio is a place where faculty and students could learn how to create uh, videos and digital uh, media, uh, all the more relevant in the COVID era where we're all having to do things remotely like we're doing right now. This was a studio uh, intended to support those, that kind of learning by both faculty and teachers. Uh, team project team rooms or collaborative spaces. The pop-up show space is a way to amplify and broadcast uh, the innovative uh, activities and research that are going on at Georgia Tech and in the library, specifically out to the community and to the world. Research navigators are specialist librarians who can really help researchers home in on specific topics. They have specific relevant expertise. Quiet spaces, which have traditionally always been parts of libraries, would still need to be a part of the mix. And then lastly, the Scholars Event Network, which we'll talk about in more detail later. These were the eight plays that were informing uh, the programming process. So when the design team got engaged in earnest, we kind of continued several processes that were already underway, engaging with campus organizations such as student advisory boards, faculty, she faculty shepherds. We had workshops on campus. Uh, Georgia Tech has a long history of doing piloting and prototyping, and we did a lot of that for this project where we literally uh, employed role playing and mock ups in, in uh, abandoned spaces on campus where we could document and role play the various um, activities embedded within the plays. One example of that was a geofencing piloting program uh, that we did to uh, test out the idea of students opting in on their mobile devices to use an app that would tell them where an empty seat was located in the library, just as a test of concept of how geofencing could work. Stuart, Stuart is a member of the Georgia Tech faculty for many, many years and actually did multiple studios uh, in the College of Architecture to leverage the talent and energy of the architecture students and faculty towards solving some of the challenges that the plays and the, and the, the vision and the program was starting to uh, put forward uh, for the library renewal project. We also looked at the history of the library in general. And what we found was that there's a specific relationship between media, which in across from ancient times until the information age has evolved from scrolls to tablets to books to uh, miniaturized information on microfilm and microfiche, and ultimately to the computer and the cloud. Each of those sort of me each of those types of media implied a different technology. And each of the technologies reply, implied a different way to store that technology in a library institution. And that led to various building types across history that were needed to address those types of media and storage, which created a paradigm in the far right column of what the library of any particular era was like. One of the interesting things that we found in this process is that in the information age where we're drifting toward an, uh, a learning commons model of library has more in common with the most ancient models of libraries, which actually would resemble to our modern eyes more like a museum than what we would think of as a library, in which there are multiple forms of media, not only books and written things, but objects and lots of other types of activities, interactive conversation, words, lots of different things happening. Uh, there's some real coalescence between the ancient and the most current, which we thought was really interesting. So 
When we started really programming and designing in earnest, uh, we had set the table with lots of information and it posed one very fundamental question to the design team. And the question is this, if over the centuries, it's been the overwhelming presence of books that's been the defining characteristic of a library, and if the overwhelming presence of books in the library has been the thing that connotes the idea of scholarship and the inspiration of scholars, how then can a library whose collection is increasingly digital, virtual, and invisible still be a library, still inspire scholarship, and still be the place of inspiration that we expect our libraries to be? It's a big challenge. And if that weren't enough, uh, Georgia Tech Dean of Libraries, Catherine Murray Rust, told the design team that what she really wanted us to do was to help them make the invisible visible. And it's a, uh, it's a, it's a great challenge, and it's one we were really excited to take on as a design team. So we went back to the plays. What we found was that these were all interesting ideas in and of themselves, but they were kind of a loose constellation of concepts rather than a structured program. So we looked for ways to structure it, and one of the ways we structured them was to see them along a spectrum that ranged from what we call operational to aspirational. So the operational end of the spectrum would be activities that are core to the library's mission of delivering literal services to people on a day-to-day -day basis. So in the studio, in the teaching studio, in the project team rooms, and in the innovation and ideation studio, the digital and physical media, the AV and the other equipment, needed to help the library deliver those services is what we're calling operational media. Aspirational would respond more to this ineffable sort of idea that a library is a place of inspiration. And so the quiet spaces, pop-up show spaces, virtual environment, and then the places in between were also contributing toward that understanding of what a library's job is. So these are two poles of what really the library's function is. So I'm gonna look at four examples of operational media very quickly, just so that we have an understanding of what we're talking about. And then Stuart is going to take us through four uh, very interesting examples of aspirational media. So operational media, we're talking about leveraging physical and digital media to support core library services. Uh, this is an example of, I'll say, this is in the Price Gilbert Library building, the older building, the one on the left. Uh, this is a video and audio recording suites. Uh, the Price Gilbert building has just been recently completed uh, but the COVID uh, situation has interrupted our ability to get photographs of the finished product. So you're going to see combinations of some photographs, some renderings, and some other types of imagery that we use to understand concepts. So this is the uh, audio, video and audio recording suites where students can create original material, capture it on video, capture it on audio, do uh, production in the studio and post-production, and create materials for their coursework, capstone projects, dissertations for faculty uh, uh, and for fun. Uh, another uh, example would be the visualization lab and the retro computing lab. Together they form this black, uh, this space that's able to be blacked out and is really intended for research projects and collaborative projects that rely upon ultra high def uh, immersive digital uh, video technology. So people can work at their stations, go up to the large display, and interact with, with data and imagery at a very high definition level for research projects that require that sort of thing. Retrotech is my favorite uh, component in the building. This is, this is a, a studio that's set up to uh, house and study outmoded technologies, video games, computer programs, computer devices, and hardware, so that as we study the way computers develop and become obsolete, we have a different understanding of how uh, we exist in an information culture that's continually evolving. The Ideation and Innovation Atrium in Crosland Tower is an analog space. So you see in the uh, second and third levels of the atrium beyond the glass, you see some of the more AV or computer intensive spaces. This area is an analog space intended for collaboration across disciplines in a neutral space where people can cook up ideas, kind of develop them uh, from the very beginning, more like a studio environment or a makerspace light type of space. So really, this, this performs a function in which it feeds activities into the other more technologically advanced areas or back to the colleges that the research areas came from. Then the last example we'll look at is the Scholars Event Network. 
uh, our partner Charlie Bennett of the library calls this the Broadway of research in the sense that in broad, at Broadway in New York City, you have the theaters, but you also have this whole sort of ecosystem of entertainment, food, and other things to do in and around to, to create a whole theater going experience. Just like that, the this is a place where events take place, but there's also a whole range of supporting activities, including audio recording, video, exhibition, hospitality, food service, all of these things happening relative to this space. So what we're really trying to create is a place where events can happen in the library, be recorded and captured in the library, get documented by the library, and then broadcast out to the community and the world by the library. So it's sort of a uh, conference center in miniature as a neutral place in the library on campus. It's a fascinating place that we can't wait to see uh, it in action. With that, we're going to transition over to aspirational media, and Stuart's going to talk to us about leveraging physical and digital media to inspire scholarship. Well, thank you, Brian. Uh, yeah, this has actually been a very interesting journey for us, a real challenge to, uh, as designers, to really explore new categories of placemaking uh, as we kind of enter this information age. And while media uh, seems to have been increasingly with us, mostly in the form of sort of display panels and flat screens on walls, that's just the problem. They've increased around us and proliferated so much that they're just sort of passive ambient, really, we have screen fatigue. And so how do we sort of reinvent these environments to find that intersection between the physical world and the digital world to, especially on college campuses, sort of incite curiosity, wonder, and all those things that inspire the best kind of scholarship among our students and faculty. So uh, we're gonna take you on a little bit of a tour through four of the digital, interactive digital media sites that we've been uh, designing and exploring. So the first one you're gonna see is what we call the culture creator. And uh, this one is a very interesting environment that already had the great attribute of place making with social gathering, a bit like historic Greek agoras that brought people together. And the most latest incarnation you see on campuses are these tiered seating environments that follow stairs that ascend and descend and students pause and talk to each other. And they're great already, but how could we activate it, make it particularly unique for the 21st century so that not only were people connecting person to person uh, with who's there physically, but also beyond. And that kind of uh, urge to express oneself, to have a voice and leave a mark, of course, has an analog precedent. For example, you see in the upper left, our friends at uh, um, Small Design brought up what had happened in the last election in the New York subway, where it became, in a sense, a forum for leaving post-it notes and opinions. So how could that kind of exchange of information happen in digital ways using LED technologies, but again, not just screens on the wall? So we, and we, we'll talk about how we're really adapting some very uh, standard technologies, LED arrays and streams, but in new ways. And so what you see uh, on the lower left is the currently built and occupied uh, space in the Crosland Library for gathering on these wood tiered risers. And on the right is a vision is what if those could come to life with various forms of information that are about exchange and ideas. So you'll see next the uh, various modes that this Agora can allow people to connect through being informed of information that is uh, not necessarily available in other ways, but uh, we can also be inspired by different kinds of activities that are not necessarily easily seen on campus and be immersed in places that using not only text information, but visual screens that can emerge through the physical setting. And so I'll explain that a little more now. What you're really seeing that you saw before were wood risers and wood platforms to walk on uh, and will sit on and keep those as they are, but have the kind of magic of LED information emerge almost ghost-like through it at various times. And we've experimented, as you can see on the right with the prototyping, the mock-up happening at second story with various combinations of acrylics, wood veneers, thin veneers that allow the wood to mostly predominate, but have the magic of these LED arrays 
shine through and change and be kinetic. So it's sort of an intriguing, very unusual kind of use of these technologies. And uh, the next site that we're gonna show is actually was more challenging. That first one is bathed in daylight. This one is in fact back in the shadows on the first floor of the building, but it's at a very important intersection where really we already know there's going to be a huge flow of people passing through the various main public programs of the library on the ground level. And at the crossroads, in a sense, the intersection is a very internal space that we wanted to bring to life, again, with a historic example of, as Brian mentioned, the museum is the precursor to the library. It exhibits the achievements of civilization and otherwise. And in this case, our achievements on campus are ongoing ones that change daily. And they are in fact created by our students and laboratory researchers, but they're usually hidden in the kind of uh, opaque silos of the university and in our case, the Institute and not brought to light where in fact students could be intrigued and curious about what else is going on that might interest their own careers and pursuits. So a bit like uh, you see on the left, the old posters on easels that frankly are fairly mundane at this point, how could we bring to life ways that students could create their own exhibits and have both individual places to showcase their work and have it be browsed upon pausing in this circulation path that you can get out of the stream and into the kind of alcove here and see various uh, projects and capstone projects and laboratory researches that can be public. So we're gonna show you how this works. The next one really was to in fact be very enticing that had to work at the scale of people passing by, but needed to uh, see how you're gonna interface with it in exhibit mode as you see far on the left on various topics that could uh, vary depending on which college, school or lab is being shown. But also collectively on the far right image, you see how the individual screens can be tiled and become converged as one big backdrop for presentations that can happen spontaneously or scheduled for the public to pause and take in a speaker with a big kind of uh, video backdrop behind them. So the uh, challenge was at the different telescoping levels of attracting attention from a distance and then enticing the interaction as you approach it and want to in fact be intrigued by a particular topic that you're interested in and how can you interact with it in ways that are easy do not take any training on an interface and that's where our second story was very very creative about developing new technologies that are very easy to quickly engage and uh, consider and focus on and then move on. So it makes the discovery, frankly, fun and playful. And that's very important, we think, to really be engaging of the information. And you'll see an example on the next slide that in fact shows a bit how that will work with this particular simple toggle knob that shows in fact some research going on, in this case in the College of Design, the music program and the College of Computing and other schools that are collaborating increasingly to interact on new inventive innovative technologies this case is called the disruptor and works with music ideas works with social distribution ideas and creates with just frankly ergonomics of how different interfaces work and this is a very easy way for students to engage it again now it says start again you can then <laughs> see things quickly move on to the next one and engage at your own time now, the next uh, site that we're talking about here is very important because it's really at the main entry into the library complex. And this is in the historic Price Gilbert mid-century masterpiece. It was, uh, we paused before doing this significant intervention where we actually cut through the existing building, it has very low floor to floors for, as libraries traditionally did. And we created, in fact, a much more welcoming grand two-story space that would have the circulation between what we call the lower grove level and the plaza. And this was an important point of announcing arrival and sort of introducing what you're coming into as a place of scholarship and really the centerpiece of all of this accumulated uh, 
information that is collected and worked on through the years. And that's usually uh, immortalized by having the great thinkers and names and contributors to all this knowledge inscribed in stone, as you see on the lower right in classical libraries. And how can we, in fact, update this for our time to basically honor history and have those, in fact, uh, immortals still immortalized, but increasingly engage those that will be immortal, they hope, our students who, in fact, are coming to the library to research, to engage, and hopefully contribute to that continuum, that cycle. You'll see recycle is an important word for us. And how does a cycle, in this case, by the Mobius loop that you see here, take the cycle of contributors and other people that uh, we're, you know, become icons and how do they in fact still become immortalized but flowing and kinetically taking the past, the present and those in the future that will enter this stream that will move slowly again as LED streams through a kind of uh, material wood veneer that will become sort of in view and out of view as it twists on this kind of Mobius update on a chandelier. So we're very excited about that kind of innovation there. And then the last site that we're gonna show here is frankly the most prominent and for us was the biggest opportunity to signify this new digital library for the 21st century. Because here we were in fact taking very much to heart making the invisible visible. And one of those cycles that's invisible is uh, one that Charlie Bennett, our, our friend, uh, brought to the foreground in a very creative kind of poetic way. He was very aware that we as the architects have really foregrounded and made paramount a, the green design ambitions of this building, as they are all on the Georgia Tech campus. And ecological uh, sort of priorities and energy conservation and the cycles of nature, frankly, were very paramount to our design. And he noted the metaphor to the cycles of scholarship that whereas in nature, we have the clouds above where vapors condense and form rainfall and they come down to the earth, they're collected and they're worked with uh, to provide irrigation and other functions by we humans. And he was noting that in fact, now that that information is increasingly invisible and like seemingly vapor in the digital cloud, but it does descend in particular to places like libraries where they are available, where they're curated by our great librarians and subject scholars uh, that help our students engage that information that in a sense descends from the cloud metaphorically the students then are inspired to work on it, uh, update it, and contribute and innovate to it and send that back up to the cloud for the next generation of scholars. And so that cycle you're going to see, it was very poetic inspiration for us, is really, you can't tell yet, and you'll see later when we can show a little bit of animation, it's the streams that you see vertically, very uh, mercurial in this glass prism. Uh, appear and disappear depending on viewpoint and many kinds of ways that we have tried to innovate their engagement into the glass prism. And I'll just finish by saying the other important thing, the reason this glass prism is there is we were foremost asked to reinvent a bridge that was connecting the two libraries that had become very much a barrier heretofore because of the security needed to protect book collections that was being changed. And it gave us the opportunity to in fact release this bridge that had come down to the ground and formed a wall rather than an open transparency. So it's mostly meant to be intriguing, transparent and crystalline, but it also is a canvas for this kind of cycle of scholarship that we hope will incite curiosity about it. So uh, we'll go to the next one that um, starts to show how this works. Again, a bridge is a connector. We wanted it to connect people to not only the two between the two buildings, but beyond to the campus data information that they may not realize, enrollments and prizes and awards. And then there's events happening on campus every day that students or faculty may not know about. This becomes, in a sense, you see here, a compass to where those events might be taking place. This is truly at the center of campus. So it was a great place to have this kind of compass and kind of a new sort of clock tower about the timing of events. And then people, you know, again, people, faculty, researchers, and students work very hard and a lot of their work 
isn't coming to light and how can we in different modes of exposition show those kinds of things to intrigue students and faculty to find out more about what else is going on. And then, of course, as I mentioned, places that are on campus. Here at the center, it's the center of an increasingly sprawling campus where there's so many kinds of labs, in this case showing the digital fabrication lab and other places. That's actually on Marietta Street. Who would know about it until they could see a bit of a glimpse into it in this, again, video pool that's fed by the vertical streams of information. And then scholarly pursuits that happen in these places. What's going on? What new things are being invented and are remaking the world? And then on the right, how does everyone connect to each other, not just physically and socially in spaces, but with their digital devices? Increasingly, those are ways of connecting. And how can we find this in-between world between the physical and the digital that we often call augmented reality, where the reality of the physical place is augmented by uh, information that is overlaid in real time and space through our devices? And we're hoping to, we've been working on ideas for having that canvas underneath have limited but engagement through people's devices so that crowds or individuals can sort of leave their mark temporarily and be creative and show the expressions that can happen in these ways. And then, uh, so as we kind of come to conclusion of the whole sort of uh, array of different media environments we're working on, we come back to that idea that really media has been with us in libraries since ancient times. It was in the form of stone cuneiforms and more recently in the middle there, just the printed page and books. And those were in libraries that did have those engraved inscriptions already on the outside to announce themselves. But increasingly, as we move to the right and into the present and future, there are explorations that we're doing. And then more recently, there were some ones that happened in other places that are experimenting with bricks and LEDs and all kinds of ways of doing new, fascinating, sort of in innovative ways of working with media. And so again, we wanted to inspire scholarship without that physical awe of the vast book collections as the only signifier of scholarship. These will be new ones in making the invisible visible. And uh, to further intrigue the our already very curious students, engineers, especially on this campus, are fascinated with learning how do things work? How do these clocks from past to present, how do the gears turn? And getting behind the clock and behind the machine has always been intriguing for everyone. Behind the scoreboard, behind all of these sort of usually hidden environments, we wanted to make that an intriguing curiosity to draw people into the library into the in far right the inside of a computer that at that point in sci-fi was scaled very large for the but become increasingly miniaturized so how do we intrigue and so the next slide starts to show how we explored that with real prototyping and real mock-ups and innovations on the middle you see the digital fabrication lab with a student working on different prototypes of seating that I'll explain in just a minute on the left. And on the right is the, in fact, uh, exploration of glass technologies and LED technologies interacting where we're not seeing the LED source. We're seeing its reflections and how do those stream. And so different reflectivities, different transparencies, these are all very phenomenological material things that have to be explored. And the left then shows, in fact, gives you a little bit of a preview of the kind of intrigue of it that in fact you'll notice that the text streams were facing inward and reversed what you're seeing is through reflections and refractions on the outside it varies depending on your angle of view it can be revealed or it can be somewhat concealed by the way the seating is uh, perforated and screens and makes alcoves but reveals in other ways so uh, we're going to then well we have one more slide to show here that was really the very first. You're gonna see our first rendition here and then our last in a minute. But the first one does show really the concept from the beginning was to find that intersection between the physical and digital where students have their heads down into their devices and usually it's only there. Or if they're looking up, we have our buildings and they've been separate. But could we find ways that the experience is unique to finding this 
overlay this truly magical intersection between what's virtual and what's physical beyond to give new perspectives, new ways of interfacing and connecting on information, knowledge, and scholarship. So uh, we're now uh, going to do a walkthrough on your screen. This is the video animation I'm mentioning. This shows approaching the building on the bridge in compass mode where various places are being shown. We're approaching and there would be audio to this. This is in fact Maya Angelou and her storytelling mode. Libraries are the uh, repository of stories. This one would come to the fore as an audio uh, experience as well as visual, which we think is important. We appreciate the importance of universal design where those that are have sight difficulties can hear what's being narrated. In this case, this is professors working on barriers and biases and what brought to life and the streams that are giving more information about her research as you start to see now streaming up and down in that cycle. This is a view from the outside looking in. This is where, in fact, the prism can become, in a sense, an instrument of a barometer, showing, in fact, graphically the kinds of solar energy captured in the living building and advanced environmental buildings on campus and how much energy is being saved so that students see how their behavior and their work is impacting the environment. And then if they should go inside, we hope they can, in fact, uh, take time to be with themselves, with each other on this bridge. And you'll start to see the kind of infinity reflections that gives a kind of dazzling, magical, mercurial thing of all of this information flowing. Some of it, as you can see, is not readable until it's been reflected. So the interesting perspectives from inside and out, seeing how things are different from what you think from the outside, you've got to see the inside. And frankly, that kind of sums up what students at Tech are learning about. How do things tick and how do they make the world when they know more about it? So with that, uh, I think Garrett's going to help uh, try to answer some, uh, lead us to some of the questions you've been maybe asking through our presentation here. Absolutely. And thank you, Stuart and Brian. Uh, so we have received several ex excellent questions. Uh, the first here is, how do you address the fact that media and technology become obsolete so quickly? Um become obsolete uh, so but so we've designed these things to be uh anticipatory of the fact that things would have to be changed out so the infrastructure was really our focus designing the architecture to sort of work independently of it independently of the media and to, to design the infrastructure so that it could be added and and adapted over time these things do change a lot georgia tech knows this better than anybody information technology changes a lot and its obsolescence is something that you have to plan for and think about. Second story brought a lot of value to the process. I, I would also add that our design partners, B and IM, have a slogan that really was our mantra all the way through every aspect of the design, not just the media design, and that is long life, loose fit. That's what we were designing, things that would last a long time, but would also be easy to modify once their uh, anticipated life had expired. Thanks. Next question here is, uh, how much of this technology exists today and what level of customization is required to achieve these designs? Um, well, I'll answer that. I think that uh, we were very cognitive of, uh, cognizant of trying to adapt existing technologies so that they were not relying on exotic and custom kinds of apparatuses. And so for the most part, as I was trying to explain, what you're seeing is very standard LED arrays and screens that have been around for decades. You know, you see, you know, news tickers in Times Square and scoreboards kinds of technologies. They do advance and get more refined over time, but the basic uh, technologies are standard and we just are trying to use them as architects in different physical orientations and different ways of making them defamiliar and therefore bring them, make them more uh, intriguing and unusual so they engage uh, different than just again screens hung on walls. But again, we were very hoping to be as standardized as possible. We're certainly aware of budgets and those kinds of realities. Thank you. And we have two more here uh, so far. <laughs> it says, has construction of all of these elements been completed? 
Uh, no, uh, we are currently in a bid, uh, pro bid and procurement process, and the uh, COVID has kind of put a, a, a complication in, into that process. But we did uh, complete the construction documents, put together the bid packages, and um, put them out. And uh, you know, hopefully, uh, hopefully they'll be implemented uh, uh, in the future. And it's true that it was always planned as a phased implementation, correct? That's right. We designed, like I said, I was saying before, we designed the infrastructure and the architecture to work independently of the media, but that the media could be kind of plugged into place over time as projects were able to be done. And uh, so it was really important, again, in that sort of long life, loose fit mentality that these things be able to to adapt as the as the abilities to do them. And then the last question here is, uh, are there any concerns with glare? from all of the windows and quantity of media screens. Can you speak to that? Well, I, I can actually, that's interesting. Uh, you're talking both partly as glare, the uh, abundance of light coming into a building that we did want to open up and make very transparent. So we were aware of that and we try to orient the media away from direct glare and reflections. And actually with the bridge, which has a lot of glass, Oh, that's why we mocked up uh, both inside the, you saw one that's being mocked up inside a lab. We actually took it outside into a parking deck and mocked it up with real sunlight and exposures to see how reflections and glare could work. And with the intensity of, we had to know how many lumens were going to be streaming and all of that to find the right balance between glare, uh, lumen output, energy conservation so that again i'll mention at this point that uh we were very aware that leds while increasingly can use less energy to fire up still use some and with a green building as we're hoping to be we uh looked at those modes of exposition of information so that we're not we're rarely in full screen mode we can use uh very focused and strategically precise sort of arrays of led at certain times to reduce the consumption of energy. And uh, so so we are definitely, that's a very good question. And mm -hmm. it is something that we most feel is addressed by literal mock-ups in actual spaces to get it right. That's right. For the bridge, we not only, you know, mocked it up outdoors, but as Stuart was saying, in the right solar orientation at the right height above the ground, we have some very boring pictures we could show you of us standing around a parking lot. <laughs> looking at the parking deck where those tiny little images are so that we can read the text. And it was, uh, I can't even tell you how many times we had to mock that up before we found the right combination of settings for it to work. Yeah, well, those are all very good questions. Uh, so later today, you'll receive an email that will allow you to download, download today's presentation and the option to take a short survey. Uh, we appreciate your feedback and we'll be glad to answer any future questions you may have. We hope that you'll join us for the next discussion, which will focus on reimagining how librarians work and how the new library service model takes cues from retail trends like side-by-side -side interaction, self-directed browsing, and roving staff. With that, thanks again for joining, and we look forward to talking with you again soon.